Welcome to the Real News Network. I'm Paul Jay in Baltimore. Eddie Conway was Lieutenant of Security for the Black Panther Party from 1968 to mid-1970. Incarcerated in 1970, Eddie served nearly 44 years in prison after being convicted of shooting at two police officers. One, Officer Donald Sager, died. He was released six months ago today. He declared his innocence ever since his arrest and points to the absence of any direct evidence his inability to secure legal defense of his choice during his trial, and the extent to which a jailhouse informant, I should say a notorious jailhouse informant's testimony, was relied on by the prosecution for his conviction. While incarcerated, he earned three college degrees, organized a literacy program, and ran an education and conflict resolution group for gang members, although, to use Eddie's words, street organizations. He continues now in Baltimore to work as an activist, and we're pleased and honored to have you here in the studio. Thanks for having me here. So I should have said as well, you are the author of a book, Martial Law, The Life and Times of a Baltimore Black Panther. I feel like we could do about 15 segments of, of interviews here. Uh, your, your, your history is so rich, and, and it's so, such an important uh, learning experience for people that are trying to change the world today. Um, I didn't, in your introduction, say that you were a revolutionary, and uh, as far as I can make out, you still are. You're someone that want, wanted transformational change, and to use your words, you, you put your body on the line to do it. Um, but what struck me most in, in, in reading your book, and, I, and I'll tell everyone honestly, I have read most of the book, but not all of it, but the theme that I think comes out most strongly for me is the fight to maintain your humanity. And it's not, wasn't just a fight in prison. It's a fight that happens out in the community as well. I, I guess it's a more intense fight in prison. But the force of this society's culture, this politics, economics, it's, it's very dehumanizing. Um, your book begins with your childhood experiences and, and coming, becoming aware of the extent of systemic racism and white supremacy. Uh, talk about some of your early f events that formed the way you became, came to look at the world. Well, I think probably the initial thing that, that happened uh, was when I was in the fourth grade, uh, I attended a school on uh, Mount and Rig Street, uh, 132 it was uh, uh, named. And we put on a play for Christmas, and we didn't have an auditorium, and we were allowed to go across into the white community to their elementary school to use their uh, auditorium so that our family members could come and see us act in the Christmas play. This would be about 1954 or 55? Yes, yeah, somewhere around there. Huge school. It was it was impossible. You could have set almost our whole school into their auditorium, and uh, yeah, I mean the science lab, uh, outside track, uh, swimming pool. I mean it was it was devastating, you know, for like a little eight year old, you know. Um, and uh, after that, coming back into the black community and going back to that school. Uh, it damaged us so much, we acted out that whole year. In fact, I failed the fourth grade as a result of that experience. I think that was my first contact with institutional racism in Baltimore. You grew up initially in a community that was mostly black, but then you moved to a community in downtown Baltimore, but it was still mostly white. Yes. And then you start to see white people started to leave. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, as a matter of fact, that experience was kind of uh, extended to us moving to East Baltimore. We moved to East Baltimore um, up around Preston and Milton um, Avenue, and um, there was very few black families in the community at the time. And uh, uh, within six or eight months, uh, uh, white families were fleeing the community right and left. Uh, it, it, basically became an integrated community and then eventually an all-black community. Um, and uh, the, the encounters that we had during that period was like really negative and hostile. 
uh, people not wanting us in the community, uh, and uh, it was that obviously that was a more adult-like experience because I was at that time a teenager, and we still had uh, the segregation and racism in the city. Here's a quote from uh, at his book about that period. Baltimore is south of the Mason-Dixon line, and in 2011 is probably more southern than Mississippi in 1962 in terms of segregation. But there was always the safety of numbers back then. Up until my early teens, my parents kept me away from those places where black and white intersect and sometimes conflict. My parents tried to hide the reality of second-class citizenship, so they never talked about the violence of the South, beatings and lynchings. So I was forced to figure out some of the things myself. And by that time, we were living among whites, and now they were the minority. When do you, as you, as you become a teenager, you write in the book of getting involved with some of the uh, activity of young people, which was striking out in anger against those conditions. Um, what kind of stuff? Well, we obviously, at that, at that age, we, we, there, were, there were no gangs, but there were uh, groups of guys that would hang together. It wasn't an officially gang. So uh, uh, you might want to call them crews or something like that, or just neighborhood uh, uh, gatherings. And we would come in contact with other neighborhood uh, gatherings. They, they weren't gangs. The West Side Story thing is bogus probably, right? But there were conflicts at the edge and the borders of our communities between us and them. Uh, around the use of the this baseball black, fields, black and, black and white, around the use of the baseball fields, the football fields, et cetera. Uh, even to the point, and it's probably not good to say this, but even to the point of uh, young black people uh, taking away material things from young white people like as they pass bicycles, uh, bats, gloves, skates, uh, radios, things that they brought through our communities that we didn't have. And I guess we kind of had an understanding that those things should have been things that we should have had and didn't have for whatever reason and to a great degree that probably uh, white people were responsible for that. And so we did take those things back to force violence into action, et cetera. So th this idea that there's something fundamentally unjust growing at black in Baltimore. Mm -hmm. By the time you're a teenager, that's clear to you? No, well, I mean, clear to you not just in sort of a, in a somewhat political way. It's clear. I, I don't think we understood the politics. We understood the oppression. We understood that we were treated differently uh, in our community. Uh, uh, Friday, Saturday, Sunday nights, uh, the enforcement uh, uh, agencies in our community uh, uh, treated us differently. They didn't bring us home. I mean, it wasn't a case of officer friendly. Uh, it was always a case of uh, either putting us in the trunk of a car or taking us somewhere and hitting us upside the head or, or just intimidating us. Uh, so we knew that and we knew what the general presentation was, that these are your friends, these are people that's supposed to look out and serve and take care of you, and that wasn't our reality in our community. So we knew there was something there, but we also knew that any time we ventured outside of our community, we had negative encounters, uh, either with other community people or uh, law enforcement, et cetera. So we knew that there was something seriously wrong there, even when we went downtown, say for instance. Um, your, your father, if I, if I remember correctly from the book, worked for the city? Yes. And your mother worked? No, actually she didn't. She didn't. Yeah. But you had a stable income. And, yeah. And uh, yeah. you write that you were poor, but you never wanted for food and, mm -hmm. and basics. Mm -hmm. uh, but what were the politics? What was the conversation at home about why things were the way they were? 
Well, I don't think we, I, I, and, and I'm speaking now as a, a young teenager discovering girls, uh, uh, hanging out, partying, running the streets. I don't think I even paid too much attention to the conversations that were taking place in the house. And I'm, I'm pretty sure there was like hostility and I'm pretty sure there was some, some anti-white kind of attitudes that would take place in the house among the adults. Uh, uh, at some point, I think, uh, Probably not then, but earlier. I think we had lost an uncle in Korea, uh, and it was uh, 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 not any compensation for his loss. Uh, uh, the, you know, the family was devastated by that. So there was always some things going on in the background, but there was a party Friday night, or there was a party Saturday night, or we wanted to go and hang out in the movies or something. So I didn't really have an interest in that stuff and miss most of it, right. quite honestly. So yeah. we're talking, you know, into the late 50s and then the very early 60s. Mm -hmm. um, Baltimore didn't look the way it looks now. I mean, I heard you talking to a, friend, a mutual friend mm -hmm. of ours, Mark Steiner, what it was like when you got out of prison and actually saw mm -hmm. you know, rows and rows and rows of boarded up housing and, mm -hmm. and, and, and you know, some people call these, some of the communities look like they'd been war zones or something. Mm -hmm. But that isn't what, a, the, the, growing up here, there, mm -hmm. that wasn't what it was like. Yeah, communities were actually intact. There were people uh, uh, throughout the community from different class levels, middle class, uh, uh, working class, even some close to upper class people lived in the community. Uh, you had doctors, you had lawyers, you had garbage men, you had street hustlers, you had uh, uh, teachers, you just had regular people going to work as far as point. And they were all mixed in in a space in the community, including the person that might own the store down the street or the person that owned the bar. Or, you know, up the street there might be a Cadillac, down the street there might be a Volkswagen. Uh, the, the, but there was never any abandoned houses. I mean, there might occasionally be a vacant house where somebody's moved out and somebody might move in there in a week's time, you know. Uh, so seeing the city uh, with the houses boarded up, some of the houses are, are decaying and collapsing, uh, empty lots, all oh, that's shocking to me because I, I've never seen any place that looked like that. Yeah, I mean, it's, just to remind it's everybody, a city of decay. And he was in jail for 44 years, so he hadn't seen the city for, for all of that time. Yeah. Um, by the time you're, you're you know, getting to be 15, 16, are you angry at the injustice of it? I'm, I'm not sure consciously that I mean, I, I knew there was injustice, but at the same time, I guess my desire was to, to be honest, to have fun, to party, to, to enjoy life, uh, and to try to see if I could find a way to make a life for myself. So I kind of, I was uh, looking forward to becoming independent, looking forward to, uh, uh, becoming self-sufficient. But you're getting involved in some kind of nutty stuff. I'm getting involved in all kinds of nutty stuff, uh, but I'm not getting involved in nutty stuff because uh, one of the things is I dropped out of school. Uh, I dropped out of school at 16. I was already working then and I, I, would, I, I guess I was operating under the illusion that I was doing well. I had a job. I had been working since I was 13, so uh, by the time I was 16, I was pretty secure in a sense that I could get the stuff that I wanted to get. I could buy the things that I wanted to buy, and uh, I made a decision not to go back to school. Uh, I was really having fun, and uh, and my mother confronted me and, fun and basically and partying and yeah, fun partying, enjoying, you know, uh, hanging out, etc. And my mother confronted me and basically said, like, you know, if you're going to live here, you've got to go to school. You have to finish school. And I'm like, okay, well, I got a job. I don't have to live there. I'm moving out. And so at, at 16, I moved out. And uh, 
and I moved into a living arrangement in which we had a three-story house and it was uh, about six of us. And uh, right away I discovered that um, all the fun that I was having had something to do with mom and pop paying the rent and them buying food and them paying for the electricity. I didn't realize all of that stuff had to happen. Uh, and I couldn't stay up three o'clock hanging out with my buddies and partying. Even though we had a house, we had a three-story house and it was like wild parties in there all the time. I had to be in the bed at 10 o'clock because I had to get up at five or six o'clock in the morning and go to work because you can't keep a job if you're partying all night. So I discovered the hard way that uh, all the party and all that stuff was kind of like had to go on the back burner. It had to be kind of like a weekend warrior with that. And, uh, and I had to take care of myself. But a lot of my friends continued to do wild stuff. Yeah, in the book you write about yeah. one of the guys getting involved in a fight with some New York drug dealers. Yeah. And some shooting takes place. Yeah, and, and that stuff eventually continued to happen to the point where I realized that, well, okay, I need to, uh, uh, people were going to jail. People were, uh, the, you know, the house was being raided. Things were happening. And to me, it was like, okay, I can't continue along this path because if I do, I'll end up in jail. Right. Uh, yeah. Uh, are, are you at this point in your life um, conscious at a conscious level Mm -hmm. of this idea of, of systemic racism, white supremacy, that there's something basically unjust the way, the way African Americans are dealt with in America. No, I was completely apolitical, apathetic, didn't give a darn, for the <laughs> use of a better word. I didn't, I didn't actually care. I was still enjoying life. I was still doing stuff. I mean, I knew I was fully aware that there was problems there was you know the civil rights movement was in its well its heyday or better you know uh the civil rights bills were you know uh yes, we're now coming into the early up. 60s now. yeah we're in the early 60s so you know the march on washington i mean all of that stuff was taking place uh there was you know radical talk going around uh, from Malcolm X, et cetera, you know. So it's in the uh, air, but. It's in the air, but we're having a wonderful time in this house. But you decide things are getting out of control of the house. Yes. And, and you better do something, and you join the U.S. Army. Yes, and I decided that it was time for me to relocate. So here, here's a, another quote from Eddie's book. And I, by the way, this book's available in all the normal places people buy books. I was ready to serve the nation, Eddie writes. There was no place I would not have gone, nothing I would not have done at that point for the good old U.S. of A. What did it mean to be American to you? What was Americanism? No, well, at the time, I thought that we all had the opportunity to advance, to, to uh, move forward, to, to make progress. I kind of felt like, okay, well, maybe I have dropped the ball, dropping out in party and et cetera, maybe I could pick the ball back up. Uh, uh, you're, you're, you're right that you still believe the American dream. I still believe that the American dream was possible. For black people. Uh, for black people, for all people, in fact. I, you know, uh, and I just, I, I really, I guess, you know, looking back hindsight now, I guess I really thought that oh, whatever wasn't happened correctly was my fault. You know, uh, I blamed the victim, so to speak. It was like, okay, well, I'm just not putting forth enough. I'm not going. I should have went to college. I should have did this or I should have did that. Uh, given a, a, a better effort, I could do better and I can make it. I can survive. And um, toward that end, I think, um, I looked at the American dream as the, the reality that would change the world. So that dream started to uh, shatter for you as when you were in the Army. Mm -hmm. What happened? Well, I think initially when, when being gun-ho, yeah, because I was when I went in the Army, I was gun-ho. Uh, uh, and you joined the Army in 64? 
Yeah, I joined the Army in 64, and I went through the training. I went through the advanced training, and I end up in Europe, and I end up as a medic. In Germany. In Germany. And uh, they put me in a unit, and there was 25 people in the unit. There were three black guys and 22 white guys. And one of the black guys was a sergeant, and one of the black guys were uh, private. And, and of course, I was a private myself, right? And the first thing I realized was that there was just a tremendous, and for the first two weeks, tremendous amount of racism in the Army. Every, every single day, the two people that were selected to go on KP, that's duty, or to dig ditches, or to pick up garbage, were the two black guys, me and the other guy. And it happened every day for like two weeks. And at, at, at some point, it got, it stuck to my craw, so to speak, and the one morning they came out and they said, like, we need two people from each platoon. And as they were going up the list, getting the black guys from each platoon, before they got to my platoon, I yelled out in the rank, which is like a, a no-no, you know, uh, let Conway do it, <laughs> you know, because I knew they was going to pick me anyway. They'd been picking me for two solid weeks. You know, and so it shocked the whole formation because, like, soldiers don't do this. You know, you stand there, you add attention, you keep quiet, they give you an order, you go do it. You know, so I'm, like, rebelling right there. So, in fact, what they did was they took me to the company commander's office and said, well, why did you do that? Why are you doing that? And so I explained. I said, look, I've been here for two weeks, and every single day, there's 25 of us, Every single day, only the two black guys get picked. None of the white guys been picked since I've been here. What, what, what kind of fair deal is that? You know, and it was from that point there that one, they they start leaving me alone. But two, I started looking at the environment and realized that the the structure of the army itself was southern white sergeants. Uh, that didn't have any other way of getting a job mm. and had no other way of, of being professional. Clan meeting. Yeah. And, um, and pretty much what they, they were taking in, there was a, a huge influx of blacks then, but it was like they were preparing for Vietnam. They knew Vietnam was going to happen, and they were just sucking in black guys and kind of like programming them to get ready to be cannon fodder. And uh, it, it started dawning on me then that, well, okay, there's a problem here in the Army. And I started working to kind of like with the other brothers. And, uh, and we started by 65, we were organizing, as just like they were organizing in Vietnam and so on, uh, against the racism. The Klan was there in, in, in full hooded uh, body. Uh, they were holding meetings and whatnot, and so eventually we decided to find out where they were holding their meetings, and we went and we beat the shit out of them, for the want of a better term, you know, because they were like putting little lynch, lynching symbols on the wall and stuff like that, mm -hmm. you know. And so in the day, because of their sergeant and their the sergeants and their support system, they pretty much ran the army bases. At night, we ran the army bases. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. in the next segment of the interview, we're going to talk more with Eddie Conway about how he went from someone who, in his words, couldn't care less, to someone who became a fighter. In fact, that would become the defining thing about his life, I would say, the fight for the defense of his humanity. Please join us for part two on Reality Asserts Itself with Eddie Conway.